Tonight on the Black Channel. At the dawn of the 20th century, America embarked on an ambitious goal of indoctrinating the less than white people of that era into being white. At the dawn of the 21st century, we now see the next step. The Black Channel is live. Unapologetic, unadulterated, and absolutely uncompromising. Greetings, brothers and sisters from around the world, and welcome back to the home, the haven, the stronghold, and the everlasting super fortress of intelligent black thought. We are the black media, and this is the Black Channel. And I am your host, your brother, your humble servant, the voice of black America, the black authority broadcasting to you live from the only historically black college and university of higher education and learning in the cosmos. You are, of course, welcome to join us. And join us you shall because on tonight's program, this is something in particular here. People have been contacting me about that, even though you know my rules about that kind of thing. I've been getting, it's not as if I haven't been watching it here, but I'm getting people talking about it. And I've been monitoring the situation closely. And I've decided to wait until we get to here and now because I feel like it is incumbent to address it under those circumstances. There's been a movement afoot for a while, and that movement, many folks think that they are the ones behind it, and in reality, they are not. Remember something, people, you don't have something until it becomes government policy. You don't have something until it becomes government policy. And because of that, I've been war warning you to watch out for those things because people can jump up and down and ask whatever they want to, but it doesn't matter until after it's become government policy. When you have the government enforcing it, now you have something. And for the census, there are changes that are coming. But I want you to hear exactly what those changes are. I'm taking you to the Hill. They have a story on this, and then I want to give you some background information on this. U.S. Census, and this is dated as of two days ago, or three days ago. U.S. Census changes how it categorizes people by race and ethnicity, by Nick Roberts, Robertson. The 2030 census. Now this scuttlebutt started last year, but now it's letting you know the 2030 census will include new race and ethnicity check boxes for Hispanic people and people of Middle Eastern and North African descent. The Office of Management and Budget announced Thursday a major change in how the government tracks demographics. The change is the first to race and ethnicity categories in 27 years and comes after years of criticism that major racial and ethnic groups are left out of demographic collection. By the way, folks, who was president of the United States 27 years ago? By the way, brief bit of trivia here for you. Who was the president 27 years ago? Hmm. And what party was he a member of? And I wonder if there are any connections or similarities here. Now, hmm. we'll come back to that. The revisions change how the census will ask questions about race and ethnicity, combining the previously separate questions about race and ethnicity into one and including a new category for Middle Eastern and North African people. Quote, 
Thanks to the hard work of staff across dozens of federal agencies and input from thousands of members of the public, not millions, thousands, these updated standards will help create more useful, accurate, and up-to-date federal data on race and ethnicity, U.S. Chief Statistician Karen Orvis said in a statement. These revisions will enhance our ability to compare information and data across federal agencies and also to understand how well federal programs serve a diverse America. Demographic categories for the next census will include American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian. Now listen to this part here, folks. I want you to listen to all these they have on here because they're telling you demographic categories for the next census will include American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, Middle Eastern or North African, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, and White, the OMB announced. In previous censuses, most people of Middle Eastern background were listed under the White category, and Hispanic people were considered an ethnicity separate from race. Well, isn't that what we've been telling you all here the entire time? Up until now, they are saying that up until now, Hispanic was an ethnicity. Government policy was to acknowledge being Hispanic as an ethnicity, separate from race. And we've all understood that's what being Hispanic is. It's not a race, it's an ethnicity. Well, government policy says we are going to supersede that genetics be damned. And yes, of course, you got black and African American as opposed to an eh, African immigrant. We'll come back to that. People of North African descent did not have a clear individual category. Thursday's changes cap a nearly two year process of collecting feedback from the public. More than 20,000 people gave comments for the changes and the OMB held nearly 100 listening sessions across the country. They didn't come listen to us. All federal demographic collection will reflect the new standards within five years at most, the OMB said, with changes being rolled out to government departments starting Thursday. Now, did you get that part right there? Oh, now, as far as when they're going to, uh, as far as um, collection of reflective standards, federal demographic collection will reflect those standards in five years. But as far as how they're going to start moving, they said, oh, that's going to start Thursday. So this starts next week. So what does that tell you? That tells you that this is not new. They've been aiming to do this for a while and we ready to roll it out now. Reparations? No. Reclassification? Yes. Y'all know that Drake meme, putting the hand up. Reparations? No. Reclassification? Thumbs up. Yes. The OMB also announced it would create a new task force to regularly review how the collection of race and ethnicity data for future changes and to better reflect the changing demographics of the country. So folks, they're now telling you that ethnicities and nationalities, they are now moving ethnicities and nationalities into the racial categories. Understand that now. Why is that so important? They're now telling you that we're going to go ahead and grab ethnicities and nationalities and shove those into that category there. Now you notice where we are concerned. They didn't make a move on that. Ah, 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 ah. Yes, they did. Actually, yes, they did. And that is the diabolical part of this. Remember, Joe Biden, longtime white supremacist and segregationist. And you know full well that if he's at the helm, he's got a goal. He's got a goal and he's got an aim. Want to go ahead and show you a story here from NPR. 
And there's a reason I've been sitting on this for a minute now. I've been sitting on this for a minute now, and now it's time to talk about it. For Mr. Hansi Loang, one in seven people are, quote, some other race on the U.S. census. That's a big data problem. He said this back in 2021. So this lets you know how long Joe Biden has been waiting in the wings to spring this on you. Back in 2021, this guy wrote this article here. One in seven people are some other race on the U.S. census. That's a big data problem. Why is it a big data problem here, Mr. Lo Wang? Well, you're about to hear why. For Leanna Garcia Torres, none of the boxes really fit. In 2010, she answered U.S. Census questions for the first time on her own as an adult. If she of Hispanic, is she of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? What? Well, well, isn't this what we've been pointing out for the longest time now? Haven't we been pointing out that that's not a race, it's an ethnicity, and that many of these people wish to identify as white, which means clinging on to Spanish origin. That if they identify as being of Spanish lineage, then they say that they are white, despite your attempts to minoritize them. Now, we've been saying this here on the Black Channel for a decade and a half. Now, all these years later, you have these people sit up here and say that, acknowledging that that, what is is fueling this desire to want to identify as being Spanish, even though by her own admission, she said that was easy. She marked, yes, Puerto Rican. So her people are from Puerto Rico, but uh, Spanish origin, Eh, that that can work for me. But she says that was easy. She marked, yes, Puerto Rico. But then came the stumper. What is her race? Whenever that question is posed, it does raise a little bit of anxiety. Garcia Torres explains, quote, I actually remember calling my dad and saying, what race are you putting? I don't know what to put. So this man raised her and yet his daughter does not know what her racial racial category is. Now, folks, why is it that the American government is so concerned about this? Why is this that this concerns them so much? And I will explain to you why it is. It is a matter of government policy, not opinion, but government policy rests on this. They need to know and have a proper head count of Everyone who identifies as white, even if technically you are not, we want to know everyone who identifies who is on team white. And you cannot leave this up to chance. We need to go do a head count who identifies as being on our team. Even if they technically are not, they will still support our policies. We need to know who our who our members and our allies are. We need to know how many of these people out here are ignoring genetics and are obeying socialization. And that's what this is about. Finding out how much of the population is team white. Now you're going to give them the ability to, you're not giving them the ability to cross, uh, to cross identify anymore. You are requiring them now to pick a side. You are now requiring that they pick a side. And you've made it real slick to be able to do that. You've made it real slick to be able to do that. But now you are demanding that they choose a side. Goes on to say here, the categories the once a decade head count uses, white, black, an American Indian or Alaska native put those of Asian and Pacific Islander groups plus those of Asian and Pacific Islander groups have never resonated with her. It's tricky. The Brooklyn, New York resident by way of Tennessee says both of my parents are from the Island of Puerto Rico and we're just historically pretty mixed. If you look at anyone in my family, you wouldn't really be able to guess a race. We just look vaguely tan. I would say in the end, 
For both the 2010 and 2020 counts, Garcia Torres settled with checking off a box called Some Other Race. And last year, so did Frank Alvarez of Los Angeles. So you can see the demographic that is having trouble with this. It's not everyone. It's one demographic. Now it is time to give them the choice to either integrate into whiteness or to separate themselves off into some other category where you will not get the white benefits. It's a chin check moment. At the beginning of the 20th century, this was what was done for the Italians and the Irish. Latinos, white Latinos used to be Spaniards and white, then they got moved out. Now at the beginning of the 21st century, the choice is being brought back to them again. Because you see, the issue is they are now being required to divorce themselves from anything that would identify you with blackness. So you will now be given one of three choices. You can continue to identify as white. You can identify yourself as Latino or eh, you sure you want to get too close to the Negroes? Are you certain? Okay. Quote, I just identify with my ethnicity. So do you see the insanity here? I mean, we're, we're, if you're being asked about race, that's got nothing to do with ethnicity. But they're making it a point here now, aren't they? I just identify with my ethnicity growing up. We were in a very traditional Guatemalan home, says Alvarez, who adds he was disappointed not to see Hispanic or Guatemalan as an option for the race question. I almost wanted to just skip that question, to be honest. Now... Here comes the issue, right here. And this was back in 2021 now, three years ago. Here's the issue right here. Nationwide, some 45 million Latinos were recorded as identifying with a mysterious alternative to what the federal government considers to be the major racial groups. They either marked the some other race box or wrote in a response that the bureau sorted into that category in recent decades many immigrants have also come to see some other race as they their preferred checkbox especially people with roots in the middle east or north africa whom the u.s government categorizes as white or from afro-caribbean groups so this is requiring people to separate themselves. Now this, they've always understood that this was ethnicity, not race. Do you understand the difference between those two things? Of course they do. This is about get figuring out where your allegiances lie. That's what this is about now is finding out what is your allegiance. Altogether totaling close to 50 million or more than one in seven people living in the U.S., their numbers help the catch-all category rise through the ranks of census results. Do you understand what that means right there? They're not playing around with that, man. They're not playing around with that at all. They're telling you that 50 percent of the population is malleable is what they're telling you altogether totaling close to 50 million people one in more than seven people living in the u.s their numbers help the catch-all category rise through the ranks of census results rise through the ranks so in other words they've been keeping that other category out there as a survey question to find out when you got to this point well what do you know 15% outnumbers what group of people? Damn! Well, 15% would put them in line with what group of people in America? Who in America has got a population that they say is around 15%? Hmm, a troublesome group of people who we need to make sure that we have waited the 
social and political and demographics against them because they have a legitimate claim against the U.S. government. So we will not send Anglos necessarily. We're going to get, we have got a whole buffer class together. If you want to know whether or not I told you a decade ago, hey, these numbers are legit from the census because they need to catalog and track the buffer class size changing. They need to know who they can put in and who's got enough numbers to put in our way to deflect government policy towards helping. They need to know that. What was once the country's third largest racial category in 2000 and 2010 outpaced black last year to become the second largest after white and a major data problem that could hinder progress towards racial equality over the next 10 years. People, he says it right here in the article. They've been tracking it now and take a look who the target is. They didn't say that it outpaced traditional Latino or Hispanic numbers. They didn't say that. They said that it outpaced black. So in other words, they're keeping track of these numbers for one primary purpose and one primary purpose only to see how much of a buffer it puts between white society and us. Why did they not name any other group? Because the other groups are not being targeted. That's not who they got the government policy towards illegal immigration to target. It's not here to target them. It's here to target you. And they're saying it. Yeah, we're watching who it's targeting. And I said this over a decade and a half ago. So if you were listening then, you were well aware of it. If you're just listening now, you're way behind. The some other race group was not supposed to be this big. Lie. When the Census Bureau first used an other race option in 1910. When the Census Bureau first used an other option, other race option in 1910. For the national tally, it wasn't meant to generate large numbers. By the way, yeah, a little over a century ago, at the turn of the century, here we are again, they're letting you know this is government policy. You're at the end of the next century, it is time to start the reclassification. It's time to start the official reclassification effort again. We did it a century ago, it's time to do it again. Census workers who used to assign people their race by observation were instructed to note those who didn't fall within the provided categories with a shorthand OT on forms and spell out their race. According to the one, according to one of the bureau's 1910 census reports that ultimately count produced a count of 5,012 Koreans, 3,249 Filipinos, 2,545 Hindus, and a scattering represent a representation of other races. When the Bureau started allowing all U.S. residents to self-report their racial identities in 1960, now who was make folks? It always circles back around to us. Now, who was it who was making strides in this country? And who was the spotlight on from the 1940s through the 1960s? Who was getting legislation passed That was specifically, supposedly, to focus on them. And what do you know? Between the 1940s and 1970s, what do they do all of a sudden? Why, we're changing government policies. We're changing immigration law. Um, On the census, we're going to start for the first time ever allowing people to self-report their racial identity. Well, just in time for us to start getting legislation that would benefit us. Now, government policy at the exact same moment. And then nine years later, immigration changes. You think that was accidental? That all that, all these monumental historic changes happened at the exact same time. 
we start making moves and then the federal government starts making really weird, strange changes. And then you find out they're not weird, just strange. And they probably fooled a lot of black folks into thinking, oh, don't worry, this is for your benefit. They were looking 60, 70 years down the road and saying, this will overturn whatever legislative changes we're making. These government policies will neutralize whatever legislation we put in place for you. By 2000, a checkbox for some other race made its first appearance and it was almost its last. The Bureau had proposed to remove it from the 2010 census form because it had become, quote, a source of non-comparability between census information and survey data from other government agencies that don't use a some other race category. Getting rid of it, Bureau officials had hoped, could help more Latinx people answer the census race question. Just like the movie The Matrix Reloaded, they need to be given a choice to identify as white and to identify squarely as white. Folks, if the census is intended to have a, pro if the whole purpose of the census is to count accurately the race of people, then why are you starting to group in ethnicity and geography and nationality as a racial question? then that's obviously not your reason for doing the head count or for asking them that question. You want to know, you want to have a heads up of how socially the society is changing to see who identifies as team white. And this is another mechanism now meant to prod them and move maneuver them into identifying as team white. Quote, for a long time, there. let me explain what I mean by that. You don't want people sitting up here misidentifying themselves. I mean, if they're Asian and want to identify as black, or if they're Asian, it doesn't matter how black they feel. You're not black, you're Asian. You're not black, you're Asian. So it makes no sense for you to allow them to misrepresent themselves. What good is a census that allows people to misrepresent themselves? Well, there's one group of people on the census who do not misrepresent their race. Now, isn't there? Now, we all know for certain that there is one group, there's one race on the U.S. census that uniformly identifies themselves and identifies themselves accurately. They're not trying to identify as anybody else. Everybody else is trying to figure out how to identify as them, but they're not trying to identify as anybody else. So you're pretty certain that that head count for that group's number will be accurate. Which, so since you know white society is not trying to identify as anyone else, their numbers will be solid. You really want to find out which of these other ethnicities is aligned with you. So whether or not they genetically or ethnically are moving in your direction and identifying your way, that's what you're trying to find out. Of course, they're not white or Caucasian, not, not, not officially inducted. You want to know which ones are trying to be. That's what you really want to know. Whether or not they identify as being white adjacent or black adjacent, that's the part you want to know. For a long time, there was the sense that there wasn't anything wrong with the question, but rather that Hispanics didn't understand the question. And I remember thinking, wow, says Clara Rodriguez, a sociologist at Fordham University and author of Changing Race, Latinos, the Census, and the History of Ethnicity in the United States. Some other race was something to be taken seriously, not to be dismissed as a misunderstanding on the part of the Hispanic population. In 2004, a congressional mandate requiring the census to include a some other race category was introduced by then Representative Jose Serrano of New York, who was the top Democrat on the House Appropriations Committee that funds the Bureau. The move was championed by Latino civil rights groups concerned that removing the option would lead to inaccurate counts of other racial categories that are used to redraw voting districts and enforce 
anti-discrimination laws. So if you all think these changes in these categories are just bureaucratic or academic, no, these changes in these categories will be used by the federal government in how they draw voting districts and how they fund communities and enforce anti-discrimination laws. You mean like dropping a bag in New York for the Asians for stop Asian hate me while with black folk is open season? I want to show you all the direct connection between discussing these things in an academic sense and what happens when they become government policy. You can have a movement all you want to. Things get rolling when it becomes, when the government buckles and makes it government policy. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing. If you all agree with that, Give me the thumbs up emoji in the chat room and hit the likes button for me. There's over 4,000 people in here live tonight. And we are giving you a lesson about this that will be very, very important going forward because every single person in here is going to deal with this. A growing some other race group obscures the identities of many Latinos. Tell me more. Part of that reality, however, is that a growing some other race population remains a huge data problem says G. Christina Mora, a sociologist at the University of California, Berkeley, who studies how race and ethnicity are categorized and is concerned about how that category obscures the racial identities of many Latinx people. This is a red flag. It's been a red flag that's been around for a very long time, adds Mora. If we're not represented in the data, we're never going to have a true sense of racial justice. Oh, somebody is denying Latinos justice? Hmm. And the implications touch almost every aspect of people's lives, including their health, explains Louisa Burrell, a professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at the City University of New York's Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. By the way, see my last program last week about New York is a problem. We can't really identify who those people are, Burrell says of the some other race population. That's going to be a group that is going to be left out when it comes to tabulations for mortality for any health outcome. Really? And they talk about the Trump uh, administration here. But you see this next part here. Now, this was three years ago that NPR said this three years ago. By the way, you see code switch over here. What does it mean to be Latino? The light skin privilege edition. All right. There could be changes in time for the 2030 census. As the Bureau ramps up its planning for the 2030 census, some researchers are calling for the federal government to consider a different race of uh, adding a different kind of race question, including Nancy Lopez, a sociologist at the University of New Mexico, whose research has focused on people's street race or what they think strangers assume their race to be. Not every Latino is a brown-skinned Latino. Oh, tell me more, Miss Lopez. Not every Latino is a brown-skinned Latino. There are white Latinos, there are black Latinos like myself, and there are Latinos who are also street race Asian says Lopez, who adds she's concerned about the limitations of data about how people self-identify. So, after us saying it for years and years, NPR acknowledges it right as they say, by the way, let's have a mashup. Now, I don't know what she means by street race. Street race. As I said last week, this is what happens when you allow the silly people to start talking. What would be the civil rights use of the data when we recognize that most people are being racialized by others when they seek housing or vote or seek employment? So she wants the ability, she's defending the ability to identify as however you want to. Which one benefits me most? OMB's current standards note that, quote, 
Self-identification is the preferred means of obtaining information about an individual's race and ethnicity, except in instances where observer identification is more practical. Did you get that? So that right there, observer identification is more practical. Observer, they mean the person with the census taking the head count. Well, I'm white and I say so. I'm white and I say so. Did you get that? I'm white and I say so. Did, do you understand? Well, our, our agent with the census can override whatever you say. Well, that makes perfect sense, although I wonder how that can be abused. We'll see. For the Bureau's research on race and ethnicity leading up to the 2020 census, it says in a statement to NPR that while it did ask some participants about how they were perceived by others, the data is, quote, not suitable for release, given that it was for exploratory research purposes. So in other words, they've got to count on people who have told them about how they were perceived by others. But they're like, yeah, we don't want to, that was just for, Experimental purposes, and we don't really need to go in that. Oh, let's keep those numbers to ourselves. I'm going to end right here with the saying, whatever questions end up on the 2030 census forms, Jaleesa R.C. of Los Angeles says her one hope is to see a Latino category under a race question. Last year, instead of marking white, last year, Instead of marking white, as she used to on forms that asked for her racial identity, R.C., an immigrant from Mexico, an immigrant from Mexico, an immigrant from Mexico, says she selected American Indian or Alaska Native, Chinese, and some other race. Did you get that? She can sit up here and try to protest all she wants to and says, oh, you know, we, we need to be classified differently. We've been here since before it was called the United States. And yet she said I'm white. And yet she said I'm white. And what I'm telling you is, by the way, she can protest all she wants to. What are her children going to identify as when they come of age? They've already got a mother who is perfectly content to identify as white, if she has three or four children, what will they identify as when she's gone and they get to choose that number for themselves? What will happen then? I want you all to be aware that this is not innocuous. I want you to be aware that the United States government is doing this specifically for the purposes of targeting us. I want you to be aware of the ramifications of this type of change and what that would mean. The ramifications of it and what it means. Now, this is two years later. Mr. Lo Wang has a new story. New Latino and Middle Eastern and North African checkboxes proposed for U.S. forms. This was as of last year. The Biden administration is proposing major changes to forms for the 2030 census and federal government surveys that would transform how Latinos and people of Middle Eastern or North African descent are counted in statistics across the United States. Latinos, Middle Eastern, North African, people who have solidly, dependably identified as white or are considered white either by the society or the government or both. You see that? That's what they're grouping together here is the other Whites, do you all remember here two years ago when I played for you, Tucker Carlson, talking about the Afghans? Do you remember that? Do you all remember when I played for you, Tucker Carlson, talking about the Afghans? Remember? And remember what Tucker Carlson said? Well, yeah, we're not in favor of uh, immigrating them over here, even though he said, when you look at them, you know, these are guys with, you know, brunette hair and blue eyes. They are essentially white people. Remember? Remember? White supremacist Tucker Carlson clearly tells you that the Afghans are essentially white people. He 
had no problem conceding to that. He wasn't trying to get them raised up, but Tucker Carlson himself said the Afghans, while they are essentially white people. I played that for you years ago because I'm keep, I keep track of this the whole time. This is government policy that you're up against now. On the left and the right, as I said last night, nobody in Jewish society is confused about whether or not white Jews are white. No one over there is confused. All they're fighting over is, wait a minute, do I get full white benefits or are y'all going to try to carve me off something else? You know I'm white. Am I going to get my full white card or are you going to give me like a beige white card? No. We want our full white card. There is no argument in white society as to whether or not these are white people. The argument is over how much power should they have and who's in control. That's the argument. That's the debate. Not are we dealing with white people, but how much benefits should they have as white people? And I've been telling you this now for 15 plus years. So you see who they group together and say, yeah, you're the ones that we're we're giving more leeway to. Black folk, don't worry about it. Especially those of you of slave descent, don't worry about that. You, you, you'll be where you are. You'll be good. Everybody else, eh, we're making some adjustments for them. A new check box for Middle Eastern or North African and a Hispanic or Latino box. Hispanic or Latino. All right. That appears under a reformatted question asking for a person's race or ethnicity are among the early recommendations announced in a federal register notice, which was made available on January 26th for public inspection ahead of its official publication. If approved, and it is, the changes would address long-standing difficulties many Latinos have had in answering a question about race that does not include a response option for Hispanic or Latino, which the federal government recognizes only as an ethnicity that can be of any race, because that is what it is. And yet they're now saying, you know what? We want to give them the ability to racially classify. And I submit to all of you that what will occur is these, this is going to actually influence more Latinos to identify as white. That's the part I want you all to get. This is actually going to make ease of access for more Latinos, more white Latinos to identify as white. Understand that. First, they're going to give you a lane to identify, to separate yourself from black folk. You don't have to be in the same bag with them, but really you're going to want to go further. You're going to want to go further because remember, even black Latinos can put themselves in the same bucket with the white Latinos. Now, that's the part that's not going to change. The only thing that's going to, because before they wanted to know if you were a white Latino, that's why the questions seem confusing. Are you white? Are you Hispanic white or Hispanic black? Well, by separating those categories, this is meant to make the black Latinos not identify as Latino, although many will still do so which will in turn put more pressure on these other folks. Yeah, you ain't going to get away from that. You might as well go ahead and put yourself over here as white. That's the one thing the Negroes can't do. If you don't want black Latinos identifying as Latino with you and the other white Latinos, then the only option you got left as a white Latino is to step over and claim white. That's the only thing you'll have left is to claim white. You can see who else is happy here. The reforms will also mark a major advancement for advocates for Arab Americans and other media groups who have long campaigned for their own checkbox. While the U.S. government currently categorizes people with origins in Lebanon, Iran, Egypt, and other countries in the Mania region as white, many people of Mania descent do not identify as white people, except when they're enslaving black people. I'm adding that part there. But by the way, when they got slave trading to do, 
when they got racism to perform, uh, all of a sudden they, they become pretty white then. Just thought I'd go ahead and throw that in there. So do you see it's the same thing? This is intended to give them a way of distant. They want to be able to more accurately count the Negroes. They want to more accurately count the black folk. So they want to make these categories where these white adjacent people can separate themselves from the black ones. This will allow the white adjacent to separate themselves from the black ones. So when you hear about the Hispanic and Latino one now and the mania category, and uh, this is for the white adjacent. Just understand that's what it means. White adjacent. Before now, you had to claim something else. We, we just counted you as white. Now it's okay. You're going to be white adjacent. We want to get those numbers straighter. And you'll have to if you're going to distance yourself from the undesirables. You're going to have to. What this is intended to do is number one, is going to cut down on the official black numbers. That's the first thing. Now it will cut down on the official black numbers because by removing a black Hispanic category, that's intended, you got a whole bunch of immigrants up there in that New York area and other places, they're black folk, but now you're giving them the ability, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me here. You're now giving them the ability to opt out of blackness. So even if they can't opt in to whiteness, you're now giving them an avenue to opt out of blackness. Now they'll just say, oh, well, I'm Latino. Well, you have the option of still counting yourself as black. Yeah, but that would get in my way of chasing these white Dominican chicks. So I'm, I'm Latino. So just understand what this is really intended to do. This is intended to lure people away from blackness and toward whiteness. People who used to just get automatically classified as black, now they're giving them the ability to do that. So you see folks, when we discuss the need for us to distinguish ourselves from some of these other black adjacent groups, it is because we need to know everybody who's on board. Not folks who are wishy-washy and they're having a bad hair day and they couldn't get, you know, Becky to call them back. So all of a sudden they're black today. And as soon as they can get some interracial sexual access, okay, we ain't black no more. This is the reason why we've had to make that distinction because our blackness is not a jacket that we can pick, put on and take off. So to all the people who want to sit up here and cross identify, this gives them the a magnet or an incentive to be able to edge away from blackness. Now they can't get over into whiteness, but it gives them the ability to edge away from blackness. That's what this will now by government official government policy, official government policy will now allow people to distance themselves from blackness based on identity and to also distance themselves from blackness and merge into whiteness by choice. They will now have the choice of identifying as white. And that comes in damn handy. That comes in damn handy because understand at the end of the day, these white Latinos don't want a other category. What they want are their full-blown damn white rights. But there's a reason that they've been unable to gain them. There's a reason that they've been unable to get them. There's a reason for that. And just like with the white Jewish community, that's the wall they're looking to knock down. They want to get their Ted Cruz, Jennifer Lopez, Jessica Alba, Ava Longoria card. They're trying to get that one. They're trying to get that one. And what I want to do here is I want to explain to you exactly how this has occurred. I want to show you the last time that this occurred, the last time this happened so that you have a proper understanding of what they're doing this time. This is official government strategy. 
not just policy, but strategy. It didn't come out of nowhere. As the white population, black population numbers went up after antebellum slavery, the white population here couldn't bring in immigrants fast enough and then started inculcating the not exactly white immigrants into whiteness. And remember, there was animosity toward that clean through the 1960s. It isn't until an Irishman, President JFK, gets assassinated that the attitude toward the Irish as an other than white substantively began to change. But it wasn't until then. We're going to get into that here in just a few moments. Before we do, we're going to take a very brief commercial, non-commercial break. I want to thank everyone who has contributed to support tonight's program here on PayPal, Super Chat, Venmo, my man, Mr. Richburg. Thank you very much for your support, brother, tonight. We appreciate that. Mr. McLean, Alex, everyone else here, thank you very much for your support. We're going to take a very brief commercial, non-commercial break. When we come back, let me explain to you exactly how they're going to do this and exactly how it's going to affect you. This is the Black Channel. Hello, my name is Steve Burgess, and I'm the author of this book, Guidelines for the Successful Student, a closer look at parenting your school-aged child. In this book, I've explained the role of the parent and the student in addition to what accommodations, procedures, rewards and consequences, and expectations that need to be in place to ensure student success from primary to high school. This book is available on Amazon.com. For more information, please visit my link tree at Easy One On One and to access my latest podcast, A Teaching Moment with Mr. B. Thank you all for listening. A white supremacist assassin seeks revenge. Corrupt FBI agents with evil intentions. Dangerous black collaborators dedicated to treason. Occam Jeffers must defeat them all and somehow survive. One misstep and he's a dead man. Join Occam Jeffers as he looks the devil in his blue eyes and tells him, Black First. A sequel to the underground hit War of the Heart, Spirit of 1811 Publishing presents God Love Us on sale at Amazon. Pre-order and save today. Visit spiritof1811publishing.com and show your love. Order yours today to experience all the benefits of Ash Kick and Natural Body Butter. With skin so smooth and soft, you'll thank us for it. Shop Ash Kick and online. That's A S H K I C K I N dot com. Hi, this is Brenda Starr, creator of Poetry with a Purpose and author of the book, Press But Not Crushed. Press But Not Crushed is an anthology of political poems that address current and historical issues in American descendants of slave population and African-American population. The book describes slavery and its residuals, Jim Crow segregation, social depredation, and other relevant issues to American descendants of slaves and African Americans, including the current political climate that does not address our issues. This is the Black Channel. I am your host, your brother, your humble servant, the Black Authority. Very glad to be with you all here this evening. And I would like to take you down a storybook trail right here, right now. There's... There's an article that was written by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Some of you may be familiar with her and great article from a couple of years ago, by the way, the same year that Biden was proposing this change of the census. And she wrote a book, by the way, I think it's worth your picking up if you want to. It's up to you. For those of you who've heard of it before called Not a Nation of Immigrants. 
settler colonialism, white supremacy, and a history of erasure and exclusion. Found that to be very, very interesting here. And there's an article that she wrote for Teen Vogue I think this is a good one for you all to familiarize yourselves with. I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're going to skip down as a matter of fact here because she does some prefacing on here. No, something in particular I wanted you to know. I wanted to go. I wanted to cover this part in specific. She says in my book, not a nation of immigrants. I detail how various groups of immigrants were subjected to an Americanization process intended to strip them of their cultures, languages, and memories offering them pathways to citizenship. I mean, acceptance. Oh, I don't know how I messed it up. I don't know how I messed that up right there. Uh, silly me. I don't know how I messed that up. How did I possibly think that said pathway to citizenship? Is um, No, not, not sure how that, how I stumbled in that one. All right. The following excerpt explains how Columbus played the central role in this story for Italian immigrants. Like the mass of Irish famine refugees who preceded them four decades earlier, the majority of the four million Italian immigrants to the U.S. were fleeing grinding rural poverty in southern Italy and Sicily. Before somebody tells you about how great things were going, hard work, and everything's excellent, this, that, and the other, by the way, uh, no, things were going to hell in a handbasket over there. They were a third world nation, wasn't nothing popping, and you couldn't blame it on us. We had cleared out and things went downhill, so, yeah, there you go. There you go. So you see what she's saying there? Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. They were peasants in the medieval stock. Um, they were peasants stuck in medieval socioeconomic relations, while others were proletarian sharecroppers and migrant farm workers, all without skills beyond agriculture. Interesting. Interesting. Well, they would have told you otherwise. If you ask these folks today, they rewrite their history of Italy and Southern Europe and all those places. Why they've been rewriting their history. They're telling you that everything was going great and fine. And they just came over here for a short vacation or to do you the favor of some reliable folks to come work. They, they didn't tell you, oh, no, 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 no. Um, Italy had a whole lot more in common with Ethiopia than they did with anything else and uh, certainly more than North America. No, 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 well, not, nothing like that. They need to be uh, reminded when they, what was really going on. But of course, you leave them alone. They're going to rewrite their history, which is what, by the way, the white Latinos are doing now. My mom and dad came over here. They worked real hard. Okay, that sounds familiar. Most were motivated by jobs in the booming U.S. Industrial Revolution with plans to earn money to return to Italy and buy land or start businesses. In the United States, Italian migrants, really? were met with endless insults in newspapers and magazines which described them as swarthy, kinky-haired, and criminally inclined, and regarded as racially impure in the era of the pseudo-race theory of eugenics. And I would advise you, and that's not a pseudo race theory I would advise you that's government policy I would advise you that that's government policy
Those of us who are a little bit older, those of us in your late 40s, 50s, 60s, by the way, you grew up younger and whatnot, remembering that. You grew up younger remembering those types of terms like swarthy. Swarthy simply means darker skinned. So if you want to know where the phrase tall, dark, and handsome came from, the phrase tall, dark, and handsome. Well, you knew they were talking about white men, but it's like, okay, well, who are they talking about? Tall, dark, and handsome. Their children, did you get that? Their children were often refused access to schools and adults were turned away from public places and labor unions and even in church, forced to sit in segregated church pews set aside for black people. Yes, we're going to let you know exactly where you fall in the hierarchy. You do not get to sit down here with the Anglos. You're going to have to sit over there with these other folks. That's what you're going to have to do. You got to sit over there with them. It isn't accidental. Not at all. Welcome to the American way of doing things. We're doing this so we get your attention. They were catcalled on the streets with epithets like Dago and Guinea. Well, there are some old terms there now, aren't those? The latter, a term of derision applied to enslaved Africans and their descendants and more racist insults like white N-words and N-word WAP. So you get that. So what they're letting you know is the problem they have with you is your black adjacency. That's the problem they have with you. You are black adjacent. They uh, When you find these not quite white people when you get down with what's what do you have a problem with them those are white folks yeah man and we suspect they got some negro admixture up in there that the problem always oh we are the line of demarcation we are the line of demarcation that's the way it's always been So if you want to know where government policy is directed toward, we are the line of demarcation. We're the ones that they're always looking at. So they want to know how this is going to affect us. They want to know how this is going to affect us. They want to know what this is going to do to us. And you cannot, you cannot have your non-whiteness resolved until you, we, we, we figure out what to do about that black issue for you. Until we figure out that. That's the real problem. Now, here's the part I wanted you all to see here. Thought this was rather interesting here. In 1912, 
The U.S. House Committee on Immigration debated whether Italians could be considered, quote, full-blooded Caucasians. I remember the WWE having a tag team group called Full-Blooded Italians, but all right. In 1912, the U.S. House Committee on Immigration debated whether Italians could be considered full-blooded Caucasians and immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe were considered, quote, biologically and culturally less intelligent. So I'm bringing it to you here. She's given the names, the years, who was saying it. We had, there was the U.S. government was debating if white, if Italians should be considered full-blooded Caucasians, 1912. You are barely a century after they were debating in the halls of government. Are these actually white people? Well, can they be considered? Obviously, they're white people. Can they be considered full-blooded white people? Employers often preferred light-skinned Slovaks and Poles to Italians. Railroad bosses wouldn't hire them because of their small stature. In the mining industry, English-speaking workers held the skilled and supervisory positions while Italians were hired as laborers. Even those who were educated and skilled were unable to secure any jobs besides manual labor. Only in the 1920s. Now, do you see this? 1912, we're debating what to do with you in Congress. By 1920, eight years later, only in the 1920s did Italians become more integrated into the workforce. Shout out Al Capone. More Italian immigrants were employed in semi-skilled jobs in factories as well as skilled positions. But a third remained in unskilled positions. Even Italian-American union members faced prejudice with meetings held in English and Italians were not elected to official positions. Three years after the Chicago Fair, a group of Italians in New York formed the Sons of Columbus Legion to celebrate future Columbus anniversaries, mingling with the Irish and the Knights of Columbus who had succeeded in getting the 76-foot Columbus Monument installed in the center of Columbus Circle in New York in, 19, in 1892. By then, the Irish had spread throughout the country. As Trillo notes, with the full benefits of white status, Columbus himself be became more Irish than ever until Italian Americans made new gains in the continuing contest for racial and historical legitimacy. Did you all get that? With the full benefits of white status, Columbus himself, who they never doubted his whiteness, well, other people, the Irish... Other people saw how they could use that for their benefit. Columbus himself became more Irish than ever until Italian Americans made new gains in the continuing contest for racial and historical legitimacy. Legitimacy means whiteness. Can I be legitimized as white? The Knights lobbied state legislatures for, to establish October 12th as a legal holiday. And by 1912, that sounds damn familiar. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that, 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 that was a banner year, wasn't it? A banner year. By 1912, they had succeeded in 14 states and two decades later convinced the Franklin Roosevelt administration to make it a federal holiday. Did you get that? 
the oppressed masses of Italian immigrants would find the attachment to Columbus an avenue to acceptance. They realized that the accepted representation of Columbus as first founder of the United States served to connect being Catholic and being Italian with the very birth of the United States. People, some of y'all are gonna have to learn I'm not just making this up as I go along. I was, I've reserved this weekend because I wanted to connect these dovetails. I spent last night beating this thing like a drum to let you know the fight here is for these not so quite white groups or not exactly white groups to center themselves culturally if they can't do it genetically or geographically to center themselves culturally. To say, hey, this society actually owes its existence to us. Well, it's, well, what about Europe? Well, no, not there. Well, uh, the Middle East. Well, you're Christian, aren't you? These are Abrahamic religions. Well, we're Jewish. And you owe that to us. And, and oh, no, 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 no. Christopher Columbus, he was one of us. And wasn't that where America starts is, is with us. So the, I'm, what I'm telling you is that these groups have been trying to use these mech, these cultural and debating mechanisms to legitimize themselves and to out white the Anglos. That's the debate that's going on over there on their side. They're trying to out white the Anglos. And they believe that, okay, if we can't draw ourselves directly from Northern Europe or we can't make ourselves Anglos, then we can make ourselves descendants of the Romans. If we can't make ourselves descendants of the Romans, we'll make ourselves descendants of your religion. If we can't make ourselves descendants of your religions, we'll make ourselves descendants of Columbus. So I'm, I, I was beating this to death last night, and now I want you to see how this all comes together. Jason, why did you wait until the night to do this story here? Because I want to show you all how this all comes together now. These are not conversations that black people have amongst ourselves. Because... I will not say that we see them all as, mm, as Ice-T might put it in, in the inverse, uh, one big Caucasian. Damn! But what I will say is that as black people, we don't make those distinctions. Truth be told, these other folks don't make these distinctions unless there's something they're trying to get out of it and they need to hash this out. So I gave it to you from all these perspectives so you can see everybody is trying to use some mechanism to out-white the Anglos so that if they are over represent if they are outweighing themselves in some regard then now they get to sit up here and say okay let me claim something different you can't deny my whiteness because well i'm clicked up with columbus i'm more white than you are okay i'm not more white than you are but i'm more american than you are which is really a backdoor for white but you get the idea i wanted you all to see that that's exactly how that works that's exactly the way it works for everybody, except us. And I want to be the first one to go on the record here tonight. I wish to be the first one to go on the record here tonight to say something that you haven't heard, not from a legitimate source right here, but you certainly haven't heard it like this. People, I want to go on the record here tonight to let you know, over the course of the next century, none of us will be here to see it, unless we're all hella old, None of us will be here to see it. And that is the diabolical strategy of white supremacy over the centuries. Nobody in living memory will still be around to remember what happened when they integrated the Latinos back into white society. But by the turn of the 22nd century, Expect them to begin the process of integrating the so-called Asians and so-called Orientals, the Chinese, the Japanese. Look for them to finally get their call up that if they choose to identify, then they will be given permission to cross over also. None of us will be here for it. I have no way of proving this to anybody listening to me right now. At our ages, I don't know if the children will live long enough, but tell your kids, mark my words. Tell the grandkids, mark my words. 
when we get to the turn of the 22nd century, the Asians will get their call up. Look for, but they're going to have to begin calling them in over the course of the next three, four decades. So you and I will be here only for the beginning of the integrating of the cultures. You're only going to see it for the beginning of the integrating of the cultures. But as far as government policy, somebody, in a, whoever gets a hold of this recording here in a hundred years, go ahead and play and let them know, hey, there were some folks who knew about it then. The game will not have changed for you a hundred years ago, a hundred years from now as it is for us. The game will not have changed. Hell, you'll probably be sitting there saying, what's a Latino? Do you understand our grandchildren, the great grandchildren, if they hear this in a hundred years, they'll be like, okay, yeah, I know about the Asian, but hey, what's a Latino? Yeah, the, the census has changed since then. Oh, y'all are old. No, now we changed that. What's a Latino? What is that? Mark my words. They realized that the accepted representation of Columbus as first founder of the United States served to connect being Catholic and being Italian with the very birth of the United States. Therefore, Italian immigrants could present themselves as Italian descendants of the original Italian founder, not so much as immigrants, but returnees as part of the origin story of the United States. I've been warning people when you see white folk online talking about we're foundational too. Understand they're going to come back and cite things like this. They are going to come back and cite things like this, that, well, we were here before there was a United States. We were here before there were colonies. Mark my words. This is the argument that will be used. Actually, they're already beginning it. Understand, folks of Scandinavian descent, Norwegian consent, a uh, descent. There's a reason why you keep hearing them talk about Leif Erikson. There's a reason that you keep hearing them invoke the name of Leif Erikson. Going back to the Vikings, they're going back as far as they can to show, well, whoever set foot over here, even if they just visited for a week, they're going to go try to find anybody and say, well, we're foundational too. Even if them folks cut and ran and, and, and packed up and left, they're still going to try to claim them. Mark my words. Historian Danielle Battisti, uh, Battisti shows how casting Columbus as, quote, the first immigrant rewrote history. Well, yeah, we're rewriting that. That's what white supremacy does, is rewrite history. Even though he never set foot on the continental landmass that became the United States, that's the real shame of it here is, by the way, he never, he didn't even touch here. He never even touched North America. Don't let that get in your way. Don't worry, they won't. We're white and we say so. Wouldn't be in America without him. Uh, he never even touched North America. Details, details. We're white and we say so. Even though he never set foot on the continental landmass that became the United States and was never an immigrant himself. And even though the English colonies that began the United States did not exist in 1492, later in 1965, what? Damn. What did I tell you all the way back over here? What did I say? If I'm really just ad-libbing this as I go along, if I'm really just winging it, by the way, if, uh, well, Jason, you extrapolating too much, them folks wasn't concerned about us, by the way. 
Now, here's where the insult comes in. Later in 1965, when Italian-Americans campaigned to overturn immigration exclusion restrictions, they employed the origin story based on Columbus to, go to, uh, to great effect. Excuse me, there was only one group of people who were fighting for civil rights. Just one. Just one. So this is an insult to our intelligence to sit up here and tell us that we out there stomping in the streets to create diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not a dirty word. We were the only ones doing that. And then you're going to sit up here and try to hand credit off to folks who were discriminating against us as if they were really making some big moves in the 1960s. As if they were making some big stuff happen. I mean, when you talk about what's his name, Joe Colombo, the mob boss with his Italian Urban League or whatever it was, Italian American League, tell me the legislation that they got passed. Tell me the major legislation that these all Italian groups got passed. Tell me the new rights and privileges that they received as a result of legislation passed for them. Show me one of these groups who got some legislation passed for them. Name the bill, name the law that they got passed. Because we can name the ones we got passed that benefited them. The immigration law that they're referring to was because of us. Directly because of us. That was us doing that. And ma'am, I don't know who the hell you are, but I mean, I do know who you are, ma'am. I don't know who the hell you think you are, ma'am. But you're going to sit up here and give credit to somebody else? Oh, no, 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 no. I can't let that pass. I cannot let that slide at all. Not at all. Matthew Fry Jacobson observes that, quote, race is absolutely central to the history of European immigration and settlement. That centrality was based in the founding 1790 naturalization law, an act to establish a uniform rule of naturalization that, quote, white persons were allowed to immigrate and become citizens. Quote, the Europeanness, that is to say, whiteness, was among the most important possessions one could lay claim to. It was their whiteness, not any kind of new world magnanimity, look it up, not any kind of new world generosity that opened the golden door. In 1971, James Baldwin wrote, quote, I had my fill of seeing people come down the gangplank on Wednesday, let us say, speaking not a word of English, and by Friday, discovering that I was working for them, and they were calling me nigger like everybody else. And this is a situation that we still live with today. Your children who are leaving school, going into college, going into the workforce, they still live with this today. They hire people. You've been there 10 years. They hire some new white kid. And before the year is over, you're training him to be your supervisor. So you still experience that in many ways today. But for those of you who don't know, on a pirate ship, the gangplank, that's that board that they have where you walk the gangplank and when they're kicking you off the ship. So you can either walk over or get tossed over. And that's why he's saying, I had my fill of seeing people come, da come down the gangplank on Wednesday speaking not a word of English, and by Friday discovering that I was working for them. Folks, is that not what they're doing at the border today? They have brought them in by the millions and given them privileges over us, and they don't speak a word, of, at least they pretend they don't speak, a word of English. And they didn't put them ahead of white people. No, they put them ahead of us, though. So James Baldwin's prophecy is still valid today. His proclamation is still valid today. They're doing it to us right now as we speak. 
folks claiming that they were walking down the game plan, claiming that they're on the outside looking in, and then within a few short years, oh, well, they quick to put them in charge. Yes, but they're only going to put them in charge over us. They are the reason why it doesn't do us any benefit to help with this illegal immigration thing is because they're bringing them in and they're not putting them in charge over white folk. They're not putting them in charge over the Anglos. They're bringing them in by the millions and putting them in charge over us. They're bringing them in and putting them over us, just not over them. Baldwin critiqued the tragedy of how the immigrants pursuing the lie of white supremacy, quote, helped to steal the vitality from immigrant communities and in the debasement and defamation of black people, they debased and defamed themselves. This is James Baldwin. Back in the 70s. This is James Baldwin back in the 70s, not in 2024. James Baldwin back then, right after King and Malcolm and all of our luminaries were murdered. This is him back then saying, hey, by the way, th these immigrants they're bringing in here, why they are attacking us as black people. This is back in the 70s. Why they're attacking us as black people. They're putting them in charge over us and they're calling us a nigga just like the Anglos are. This is him saying this back in the 70s, not some little nobody you never heard of. James Baldwin. Oh, you don't hear in your college classrooms and your college courses and whatnot. They don't cite this statement from James Baldwin. Now, do they? Now, they'll talk about something else, but you won't hear them say this quote. Now, will they? He writes, they're talking about Baldwin, quote, white people are not white. Part of the price of the ticket is to delude themselves into believing that they are. Baldwin characterized the United States as a destination where Europeans of all sorts could be melded in contrast to, quote, Negroes and Indians. He writes, quote, no one was white before he, she came to America. Rather, they were Irish, German, Italian, Jewish, English, French, Swiss, Norwegian. In the white Republican, in the white Republic, one is either white or not. Now, I would take slight issue with James Baldwin in that regard. I understand what he'd be trying to say there, but... Technically speaking, as some of them places, uh, they had a pretty good idea what white was in some of those places. So I might take a slight issue there, but I don't want to digress. Italian-American journalist Christine Grimaldi laments that she calls the Paisanos of shame. Italian ancestors and contemporary Italian-Americans such as Rudy Giuliani and Mike Pompeo who celebrate Columbus as an ancestor and embrace right-wing ideology and white supremacy. Quote, those of us who challenge whiteness through activism and essays still benefit from it too. We will never experience the racist COVID-19 backlash against Asian-American people and their businesses. Ma'am, stop. Just stop. Though the virus overtook Italy and traveled from Europe, to New York. So I wanted to read that to you all so you can see that, by the way, yeah, that's the way we're going here. The way that the Italians went, they've already perfected this formula. They've already worked it out. And now they are ready to apply it to the Latinos. It is now time for them to do that. And let me explain to you why that is. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America became a superpower. It became a superpower because of war. The United States of America became a superpower because of its ability to wage war. We built that economy and they used that economy that, they, that we built for them in order to take it around the world and dominate, which is what they currently do. But there is a problem. In the middle of their last great world war, there was a tremendous bump in the national population called the baby boom. So you had this multiplication of the American population, one that they projected would last for decades. 
but eventually that multiplication would level off, equalize, and then begin to decrease. You were able to have military bases in Japan, military bases in Germany, military bases in the Middle East, military bases on all the continents because you had a seemingly limitless supply of citizens and babies that grow to, grow to adulthood that you could send off somewhere. So your military power was never in question. You always had more soldiers that you could send around the world to inflict and enforce your will. But in the 21st century, that has begun to wane. They can no longer rely on that. The population, the white population numbers have not only gone down, but white participation in military service has actually been going down ever since Vietnam. They were the first ones to jump ship on that. Black numbers remain pretty steady, but the white numbers began going down. So you can no longer rely on the white population to fuel your war machine, not picking up guns to go shoot people. You can't rely on them the way you used to. Increasingly, you can't rely on black folk anymore to fuel your military war machine the way that they used to. So understand something, U.S. foreign policy as well as domestic policy as well as economic policy requires more people to feed the machine. And if your current population cannot or will not do it, well then bring in as many bodies as you can and they will be fast-tracked toward feeding the machine. So when it comes to their war machine, they're bringing in millions of illegals because they're looking at the population of China. Now, never mind the fact that China's population is beginning to level off and on its way to decreasing. Don't worry about that whatsoever. They want to make sure that there are sufficient numbers of bodies that the American government has control over, even if it requires a draft, that they can send into their war machine to continue holding all of these places that they've gained dominance over the last century so that they can continue their control and white supremacy. The next thing is that they also want to make sure that the economy continues to at least continue to deliver, if not expand. Because you see, corporations are always looking forward to bigger profits but you cannot get bigger profits unless you have a growing population now as that population grows as they get as people get older they work in the workforce their income goes up yeah some of them might even get rich yeah but remember corporations really make, make their money on the middle class they don't really make their money on the wealthy you can have a small company that caters to the wealthy but eh, you really got to be able to hit that middle class if you're going to maintain the margins that you have at an AT&T or a General Motors or a General Electric, you're really going to need that. You're going to need it. Take a look at the richest people in the world. Folks, the richest people in the world do not cater to the ultra wealthy. The richest people in the world cater to the middle class and lower. Jeff Bezos and Amazon. Amazon, which is nothing but Walmart via FedEx. That's all Amazon is. Uh, Elon Musk. Tesla sells cars. They just sell automobiles, soon to be selling one that costs $30,000. Okay, for those of you who want to name um, Bernard Arnault and LVMH, I'll take you up on that one there too. As a matter of fact, I'll take you up on that one there too. Now, you might believe that LVMH is some, you know, ultra luxury company. And in many ways, they certainly do have that. But let's be clear, Hennessy, uh, everybody who drinks done has some Hennessy. Moet, everybody done has some of that. Come on now. So yes, yeah, some of their stuff is ultra luxury, but let's just be clear. 
Uh, a bunch of this stuff here is not necessarily uh, a, a bunch of y'all have had access to it and have access to it on a regular basis. Have access to it on a regular basis. So I would argue, yeah, that they're, they're a mass market company that also has some luxury, ultra luxury brands. Dior. Come on now. How many women here don't have something from Dior? How many of you don't have something from Dior? We can go down the list. Sephora? Uh, How many people here, how many women here haven't shopped? How many women here consider Sephora to be some ultra luxury place? Sephora? Name a mall that doesn't have a Sephora. Name a mall that doesn't have a Tag Heuer. Name a mall that doesn't have that. Mark Jacobs. So I would argue to you that even Bernard Arno and LVMH relies on the middle class. They don't rely on the, the, the stinky, fil- filthy rich. They couldn't stay in business if those were their only customers. Rolls Royce is the most expensive car on the planet. And if they weren't owned by BMW, they would go out of business again. They can't, they can't keep it going as an independent entity. It doesn't allow you to do that. The the margins aren't there. You have to become a much smaller concern. So that's why even in the case of LVMH, the only way that all of these ultra luxury brands could survive is if they all got sucked under one roof. There's really not enough of a market for them to survive independently. Some of them will limp along as well as they can. You know, Gucci fought getting taken under. You know, some of these others fought being taken under. Sure, but those are exceptions. As a group, they got to get, they got to band together because your, your, your products are so expensive that if there's any downturn in the market at all, you ain't going to make it. You, you won't make it. So now with them all being under one roof like this, the ability for them to go under is a lot more diminished. A lot more diminished. So just keep that in mind. For some of you who might think that's the case, just keep that in mind. It didn't come out of nowhere. It didn't come out of nowhere and you're not going to be able to keep this going any other way. You're going to need these folks to feed the machine. You're going to need that economy to keep going. You're going to need to have masses of people. I told you all about this for the last couple of years here. Poor people are just as essential and necessary to a capitalist system as the rich are. As a matter of fact, I would argue to you that the poor are even more essential. Poor people are more essential and more important to a system of capitalism than the rich are. The rich need the poor. Not they want them, not they really like them. You gotta have them. And the more poor people you have, the better. The more poor people you have, the better. So just keep that in mind. If you want to know what's fueling this thing, Joe Biden wants to make sure that his children and grandchildren have plenty of non-white people who will assure that they can continue chasing drugs and hoes and everything else that they're doing and living a hedonistic life. He wants to make sure that that continues. He wants to make sure that that marches on. So if it seems to you that he's betrayed his former positions, why would he be doing this? He's doing this because this does help white interests. He's doing this because it does fuel white interests. He's doing it for the same reasons he's always done it. He's looking forward a hundred years and the situation will not have changed a hundred years from now you will still have the Anglos who are on top running things and all of their white adjacent people will still be trying to get a leg up. 
Only now they have a new carrot to chase, which is, eh, we, we, we can give you a little, a, a little honorary white card over here. You, you got this. So it gives them a new goal to shoot for. It gives them a new aspiration to pass down to their children. So the children will hear the parents and the grandparents talk about, you know, if you work hard, which we never worked hard though. And shut up, boy. If you work hard and do what you're told and play by the rules and support whiteness, eventually they're going to have to let us in. But in the meantime, you will be feeding the machine and you will be feeding the beast because you'll have to. And this is the strategy. That's why they've been stiff arming the Latinos now for decades. First, you were in his white eye, out you go, because we need to bring you back in later. Let's go ahead and bring in these Middle Eastern white folk and the Latinos. Let's go ahead and bring you all in together here. Yeah, we're telling you you can separate yourselves. In reality, we know that's exactly what's not going to occur. Some of you will, but most of you won't. And then you will simply have a group of people who will solidly identify as white. Right up until you take a look at their last name. Damn! So you see, they're not going to be able to hide because they will be able to claim being white right up until you look at their last name. And when they tell you that their last name is Gomez, their last name is Ortiz, their last name is Ruiz, their last name is Gonzalez, their last name is Cruz. Oh, it's like, okay, that's it. Yeah, you tipped your hand. There you go. So they will be able to identify you. Yeah, they'll let you into the white party, but they're like, oh, if you got an asterisk on you. Your last name ends with a Z. So they will always be able to identify you. Jason, don't you think they're worried? They're not worried about a damn thing. They know where they all are. They know where they all are. All they got to do is ask you about your family tree. That's a wrap. All they got to do is ask you about your family tree. And that is a wrap. You're done. soon as they ask about that last name of that family tree, oh, you're through. Okay, we, 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 we know what not to do with you. Maybe your kids, if you marry a white chick, but not, not you. And what I'm telling you is that if all the cost for them, if all the cost of it is, is go ahead and turn yourself over for one of the kids, man, that's a small price to pay. That is a small price to pay. They can change their last names. There's a reason why I said all they got to do is check your family tree. Oh, you can try to change your last name. Go right ahead. All they got to do is check the family tree. You can change your last name. You can't change your mom and your dad's last name. You can change your last name, but you can't change your grandpappy's last name. You can't change his. So yeah, all they got to do is just do a, a brief background check. Let's pay, check the paperwork. All they got, it, it won't take them more than one generation. I was like, okay, you think you slick. You think you're slick. Raquel Welch, Freddie Prince Jr., Martin Sheen. Yeah, you think you slick. Hold on a second. What's your daddy name? Um, 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 yeah. I said, what's your daddy name? Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, yeah, I, I, his name is, um, uh, yeah, um, Moreno Estevez. Okay, that's all you had to say. We're cool. We are? Yeah, no problem. Okay. You see what happened there? One of his sons identifies, or two of the sons identifies Estevez. One of them been like, yeah, I'm Charlie Sheen. I'm Charlie Sheen. Let me tell you something else. Oh, am I about to go there with it? I'm about to go there with it. So, my thing about it here is if you take a look at how they got down, if you take a look at how they got down, 
let me tell y'all something. Um, I always respected, I always respected the older ones. I always respected the older ones. The, especially the, I think, I think he's the oldest son. Um, I don't know about Charlie or not, but uh, Ramon. Ramon was always the one that I respected of Martin Sheen's sons. He was always the one that I respected. And I think he had a huge influence on Emilio. I think he had an influence on Emilio because Ramon has always been the most strident. He didn't really want to mess around in Hollywood. He wasn't really looking to make a name for himself. He was just like, hey, my name is Estevez. I don't give a damn about a movie. I don't give a damn about a TV role. I am Estevez. I don't care what you miss. I am Estevez. And you saw Emilio pretty much stick by that too. He's like, okay, I'm Estevez. I ain't really, if I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it as Estevez. Charlie Sheen was like, yeah, I'm Charlie Sheen. One last question. Which one of those sons was swimming in white women for decades? Damn. By the way, when you take a look at their priorities list, who was swimming, who made it their life's goal to be swimming in blonde headed, blue eyed women their whole lives? Now, I can show you two of the fellows who that wasn't really their life goal, but the one who was most successful and the one successful quotations, the one who made the biggest name for himself and everything else, by the way, I couldn't help but notice he, he moved a little different. I couldn't help but notice that by the way, the one who did want to integrate in as white, every time you looked up, he was swimming in white women. I mean, they was living all up at the house like he's Hugh Hefner Jr. So yeah, I I I, I couldn't help but notice he moved a little different. Well, it sounds like they found the they found the right coin to buy him off too, huh? Looks like they found the right coin to buy him off with, huh? Yet they knew which one of them to promote in Hollywood, didn't they? They knew what do you see what happened, folks? If you think I'm lying, oh you, okay, you can you can get yo, you can you get the, the thumbs up, you get the car, you get the pass. Yeah. Come on over here. We got a bunch of movie deals, a bunch of TV deals, just everything. You come on over here with us. Jessica Alba. Oh, here we go. I don't want to. I don't want to get sidetracked. But by the way, we could name a whole bunch of things. Huh? That that seems to be the white entrance starter pack. That seems to be the white gateway starter pack. So yeah, take a look at it. He's like, look, if you play ball, you play ball and get on the team, and we can make a few things happen for you. Like, hey, look here, bring me some drugs and some white women and I'm all yours. And they're like, done, done, no problems. And he's been there ever since. And he's been there ever since. All right. They've been cutting their teeth on this for decades. They know that these other groups want in. They know these other groups want to get called and raised up. They know that's what they want. And this helps them most importantly. And this is the point I got to beat home tonight. The changes to the census are specifically calibrated for the purposes of marginalizing us. This is intended to see if how many folks they can drag away from us and how many they can pull over in the whiteness so that they can solidify their position for the next 100 to 500 years. This is about solidifying where they're going to go for the next 100 to 500 years. 
mark my words, this is how it's going down. That is why it is more important than it has ever been for us to be on code across the board. It is more important than it's ever been for us to be on board on, on code across the board. Because these folks here are going to inculcate as many people as they can. This is why the Candace Owenses are a cancer. The reason why we've had this movement to make sure that everybody understands what the deal is and we check everybody's paperwork, the Candace Owenses of this world are a cancer. They are helping the very people who want to annihilate all of us here. They're a cancer. We do ourselves no favors by ignoring that. So our purpose is to make sure that everybody is on code. We are the trendsetters. Those of us who have survived the killing fields of America, we are the trendsetters. Those of us who were raised from slaves to saviors, we are the trendsetters. We are the leaders. And the first thing we're letting everybody know for the 21st century is get in line and get on code. We cannot accept anything else. These other folks here are now making their move officially to implement government policy to finally draft in groups that before now you're like, oh, no, 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 they're, they're not one of us. Watch, watch people, mark my words, watch. When they have an opportunity to code switch and move over to white, they're gonna do it seamlessly and without a second's hesitation because that's where the benefits are. That's where the benefits and the status is. So be looking for that. It's not an if, and, or a maybe. It's here. They're already setting you up for 2030. Watch when they start telling you, ooh, black numbers have gone down. What happened? Well, you brought in a bunch of immigrants and folks who identified as immigrants. And yeah, that strategy you started six decades ago has yeah, been kind of working out. You know what they don't want? They don't want a separate box for us. They don't want a separate checks box for us. They don't want the descendants of the slaves to have a, sec a separate check box. They don't want that. Maybe if you get everybody on code, maybe then we can keep the boxes the way they are now, but these other folks over here understand they're not actually giving more boxes. They're consolidating. They are not actually giving more boxes. They are consolidating. And they're consolidating on white. We're going to go ahead and wrap things up here tonight. If you are new here to the black channel, welcome to the Haven of Intelligent Black Thought. We do this every weekend. Click that red subscribe button. Click that notification bell. Join us each and every time that we are here. If you haven't been to our website, blackchannelfilms.com, you want to go and check out our groundbreaking, best-selling documentary work, 7 a.m., Gentrified, Race Wars, soon to be 8 a.m., all available on DVD and, well, most of them available on DVD and streaming. Go to blackchannelfilms.com. That is blackchannelfilms.com. I want to thank everyone who has contributed to support tonight's program on PayPal, Venmo, Super Chat, Thank you all for checking in. Thank you for liking, subscribing, and sharing. And this concludes tonight's broadcast of the Black Channel. I am your host, your brother, your humble servant, the Black Authority. And until next time, my brothers and my sisters from around the world, remember, Black is the future and the future.